Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dean Adrian K. Wing, and I am the director of the UI Center for Human Rights. I am also the Bessie Dutton Murray Distinguished Professor of Law and the Associate Dean for International and Comparative Law Programs. Our sponsors today include UICHR, International and Comparative Law Programs, the Political Science Department, and the Sociology and Criminology Department. Founded in 1999, UICHR is involved in programming that reaches people at the University of Iowa, Iowa City, throughout our state, the nation, and beyond. Since the pandemic began almost literally two years ago this month, We've held over 100 virtual events with over 8,000 viewers. It is my pleasure to introduce today's program on the war in Ukraine. Our distinguished panelists include Professor Brian Farrell, who is UICHR Associate Director and Law School Lecturer, UI Political Science graduate student and Ukraine native Daria Kuznetsova, ambassador and political science professor Ron McMullen, UI political science professor Bill Reisinger, and sociology and criminology professor Marina Zalitsnaya. The way we will proceed today is I will ask each panelist some questions. And then when we are done with that phase, we will open up to a Q&A. So please feel free to put any questions that you have in the Q&A. And at the end, I will look over those questions and give them to the proper panelist. So our first person uh, that we will hear from is Daria. Daria, who's at Sova is, as I said, a native of Ukraine. We are so sorry for what is happening now in your country. What are you hearing is going on with the Ukrainian civilian population beyond the headlines? What's happening with your family? And what do you hear about public opinion in Russia? Um, thank you, Professor Wynn, for the introduction. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak to you all about the current war in Ukraine. Um, today is the 14th day of war. Um, the morale is still high. The Ukrainians are not going to surrender. Uh, I see that from my personal communications with my family member and with my friends from you know various social media as well. Uh, the president of Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Zelensky, uh, keeps recording his videos, one or two, or sometimes even three a day from his office in Kiev. Uh, he's considered by many uh, as a national hero and keeps uh, our hopes up. So uh, I <clears throat> wake up in the morning and go and watch a video of what was happening, uh, you know, the day before from the presidential address. So that is um, very helpful and unites the country at the moment. Um, that being said, we see unfortunately right now that the humanitarian situation in Ukraine keeps to deteriorate. Um, today was another wave of evacuations of uh, women and children from the nearby uh, cities, uh, nearby Kiev, uh, that to my understanding was more or less successful. Some of the people were evacuated from the area to uh, safer, uh, potentially safer locations. The city of Mariupol uh, remains besieged. Uh, that's on the coast of the Sea of Azov. You probably already heard about that. Uh, I believe it is already day nine uh, as the city is occupied. Um, currently, it is a place of humanitarian catastrophe. 
Uh, we see that uh, people do not have uh, medicine, they do not have food, they do not have access to water, there is no electricity, no heating, and it is freezing temperatures in Ukraine right now, and uh, they had a little bit of snow uh, over the past couple of days. Uh, the apartment buildings not have any gas supply, and a lot of people have, have gas stoves, so uh, it, it, the situation is, is pretty bad. It is a genocide against the Ukrainian people uh, in, the, in, the, in the place. Um, I see the reports that people melt snow for, uh, you know, to drink water and burn firewood to, to keep warm. Uh, for the fourth day in a row, um, the humanitarian corridors that were discussed with the Russian uh, delegation were sabotaged by Russians. They uh, attacked the corridors today again. Um, just a couple of hours ago, um, there were reports that uh, Russian occupiers uh, struck uh, a maternity hospital in Mariupol. There are multiple casualties reported. Again, no evacuation. Uh, the Russian forces prevent people from leaving and also prevent the humanitarian aid that is already next to the city and the trucks from entering the city. So the situation there remains um, close to being, you know, catastrophic. Um, the same situation we see in the city of Valnavaha, that's a town of 25,000 people almost completely destroyed by now. Uh, some of the corridors do work. For example, the president reported that uh, some people were evacuated from Sumy to Poltava uh, yesterday, today. All right, so we're eight hours ahead in the United States here from what is happening in Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is eight hours ahead, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so, but we see that uh, it, it's very hard because Russian forces keep sabotaging the humanitarian corridor. So the humanitarian situation remains very hard in Ukraine right now. In 2014, uh, during the war in Donbass, Russia used the same tactic in Ilovaisk and Dibaltseve, where um, Kremlin would announce the green corridors for Ukrainians and that would target people leaving the city deliberately instead of uh, letting them out. So we see the same situation happening again uh, eight hours later, eight years later. Um, regarding my family, uh, I, I have family still in Ukraine, back at home in my hometown of Kramatorsk in Donetsk region of Ukraine. So this is very close to uh, Russian-occupied areas in uh, Donbas. We're not far away from uh, Russian border as well. Um, they're alive. I'm thankful for that. I'm able to be in contact with them. The internet is working. So every time I call, uh, they, things got pick up the phone. Um, that being said, a lot of people, uh, we, we did have um, shelling um, two days ago. Some rockets were intercepted today. I spoke to my family today in the morning earlier. Uh, one rocket blew up uh, right very close to a residential building. There were two people killed, uh, many injured. Uh, one block away from where my parents live, where their apartment is. Uh, so they moved um, to grandma's house for now uh, and remain there. A lot of people ask me if they're um, somewhere safe uh, or if they're being evacuated. Um, I would like to say two things on that. First is that no one is safe in Ukraine and nowhere is safe. So there are evacuations from some of the areas to you know, safer regions, but nobody really is safe because Russia keeps shelling uh, all over the territory of Ukraine. Um, second, my family is not being evacuated. They're not planning to leave at the moment as well. Uh, it is not easy to evacuate to begin with. So they're <clears throat> from where they are, um, the choice is to drive uh, a personal vehicle or take a train. Uh, trains are very full. It's very hard to take, to get a train ticket and move. Uh, also from where they are, this is the longest distance that you can imagine. Uh, that people in Ukraine would need to take to get closer to Poland or um, 
Moldova or Hungarian border. Uh, so they're staying put and we hope for the best and that this uh, war would um, end soon with um, Ukrainian victory. Um, regarding the public opinion in Russia, just a couple of remarks that I would like to address because it, it is important to know what's happening there as well, because I believe that the public opinion in Russia would influence the situation, at least to some extent. Unfortunately, the short answer about public opinion is that we don't really know uh, exactly what is happening. Um, a couple of hours ago, a couple of days ago, uh, the uh, Poland organization in Russia, Siom, uh, published a report saying that around 60% of Russians support the war. Uh, but we need to understand that these numbers are biased for a number of reasons. First of all, this is a telephone survey. Uh, people are afraid to speak the truth, even if they do not support the war. We know that uh, Russian government passed the law a couple of days ago saying that uh, for any distribution of information about the conflict, uh, about the war, uh, people might get up to 15 years in jail. So uh, it is very, you know, the, the level of self self-censorship in Russia is very high. Um, also, you know, the questions specifically asked about special military operation and not the war, uh, which is important for the context. Um, also, we need to account for the different level of exposure people in Russia have to the state-controlled media, uh, television specifically, or to alternative sources of information uh, on the internet with uh, the government being very hard on any independent media in the past couple of days. Uh, that being said, yesterday um, I saw the reports that the Navalny Center Corruption Fund uh, conducted also a survey of 700 internet users in Moscow. So this is not representative of the Russian population, right? So this is specifically in the, in the capital. Uh, but what we see is that, and they conducted four surveys uh, starting in February, and the last one was on March 3rd. What we see is that there are trends showing that more people believe now up from 29% to 53. They consider Russia the aggressor in the war. We see the growing number of people thinking that Russia is to blame for the war in Ukraine, and also growing number of Russians to value its sanctions, economic sanctions on Russia as catastrophic. So we see some positive trends happening in Russia, but there is still three big groups of population, um, people that believe the propaganda, people that knew the truth to begin with. And now we see the third group of people who are changing their opinion and switching it towards the truth. Unfortunately, the relationship between these groups and you know how big each one of them is, we don't really know, uh, but uh, we will keep monitoring the situation and see how it changes. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of that important information. And, and we will uh, hope uh, along with you that your family and uh, your friends and neighbors uh, remain safe in these very, very perilous times that, that we are in. So now I'd, I'd like to go to Professor Zaloznaya. Can you talk about the history of the relationship between Ukraine and Russia? And what's the connection between what's going on currently and the events that happened in 2014 when Crimea was annexed following protests in Ukraine? Thank you very much, Dr. Wang, and thank you for having me here, giving me this opportunity to talk to you about this extremely important ongoing situation. Um, so shortly before Russia officially invaded Ukraine, uh, Russia's President Vladimir Putin gave a long and tedious televised address, uh, address to his citizens uh, in which he justified his military operation, or what he calls military operation, limited military operation, with a largely inaccurate historic account in which he framed um, Ukraine's sovereignty and independent statehood as some sort of a Soviet time artifact that cannot and should not exist as a political entity that is fully independent of modern day Russia. Um, for Putin's version of history is important to understand, right? It gives us an insight 
into the Kremlin's mindset. It is also, however, important because it omits a number of central, central historical facts that explain, from my perspective, um, the strength of Ukraine's resistance and determination of um, Ukrainian uh, independence fighters. So rather than being a figment of Russia's imagination and therefore sort of a natural vassal, a natural uh, appendage to Russia, Ukraine is a country with a history that is, um, I would say best described as a patchwork of partial territorial and cultural control and influence by its multiple neighbors, right? So including Russia, yes, but also, and very importantly, Poland, Austro-Hungarian Empire and Lithuania. Notably absent from President Putin's account um, is a very brief, but also a very important and influential period between the two world wars from 1917 and to 1922, in which Ukraine or Ukraine's Re People's Republic was indeed a fully sovereign state prior to being forcibly subsumed into the Soviet Union in the um, early 1920s. So this brings me to another um, sort of highly problematic and central claim in President Putin's speech uh, that present day Ukraine is some sort of a Nazi state and needs to be liberated by the Russians. So to understand this claim, um, I think we need to go back to the period uh, preceding the Second World War. So right after Ukraine was subsumed into the Soviet Union and became a Republic of Ukraine, and a part of uh, the large Soviet empire. During the time, um, Ukraine, Ukrainian people experienced a series of atrocities inflicted on them by the government in Moscow including forced and violent Russification or imposition of Russian culture and language, as well as uh, artificially created famine uh, known as Holodomor that a lot of people argue is a type of a genocidal activity against Ukrainian people. So in light of this history of very violent treatment by the Soviet leadership of Ukrainian people, when the Second World War was happening and the Nazi occupation uh, took place. Some Ukrainians indeed chose to collaborate with the Nazi occupiers who they saw ultimately as liberators from the Russian oppressors. This is a controversial and complicated and a highly debated chapter of the Ukrainian history. Um, continues to be debated domestically as well as internationally. But carrying it into the present day as a justification for Russian aggression against the modern day Ukrainian state is based on claims that are completely baseless. Most importantly, and most easily tangible and evident to us, perhaps um, as nonsensical is Putin's claim uh, that Ukraine has never been an independent state, a blatant fact that in the most immediate history, Ukraine has experienced over three decades of independent statehood from 1991 to present day, since the fall of the Soviet Union to today. So much so that close to a half of Ukrainian citizens have now no meaningful clear memory of Ukraine not being independent and being somehow subservient to Russia. The unique uh, ethno-national identity of Ukrainian people and of Ukraine as a, as a nation sort of was further crystallized and defined in opposition to Russia as their country underwent two major revolutions, the Orange Revolution in to, of 2004, as well as Euromaidan, or also known as Revolution of Dignity in 2014. Each of these upheavals represented a popular rejection of Ukrainian people's rejection of Russia's attempts to control the country's political landscape, specifically by installing and supporting Russia facing uh, presidents, right? Um, as well as an expression of the popular will among the Ukrainians to jo join the Western liberal democracies as they chose independently their future political history, or sorry, a future political trajectory. 
So the last historical event that I have time to mention in my comments today is the Russia's annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. That happened shortly after uh, Euromaidan or Revolution of Dignity in 2014. And in many ways, uh, was both a reaction by Russia to Ukraine's increasing orientation towards the liberal capitalist democratic West, as well as a precursor of the events that are unfolding right now. Precisely because this annexation revealed Kremlin's willingness to break the international law, invade another country, and disregard the international agreements about sovereignty, and stake claim on the Ukrainian territory. So the annexation of Crimea, however, while it was a precursor to today's event, has to be understood as a completely different type of geopolitical um, um, occurrence. It was largely supported by the overwhelmingly ethnically Russian local population of the peninsula and um, had high levels of support within um, Russia itself among the Russian citizens. Also, it involved close to no, no civilian casualties and therefore it's markedly distinct from the bloody uh, unsupported and unpopular war of 2022 that we're observing right now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. We will now go to Professor Reisinger. What can be determined about Putin's calculations and motivations? That is, what did he expect the cost to be and what did he see or does he see as the likely gains? Well, thank you, Adrian. Russia's decision to invade Ukraine was, we now know, taken some time ago, perhaps as early as last summer. And it was made by Russian President Putin with input from a, a very narrow range of advisors. Even foreign policy experts in Moscow were certain that Putin was engaged in what's called compellence, using the threat of an invasion as uh, a way to force diplomatic concessions. They were caught flat-footed when the invasion began and are flabbergasted that Putin chose to take such a risky path. So no one really knows why Putin made this decision and we can't use Putin's own statements because he's been lying pretty consistently about things. Really reliable explanations are gonna need to wait for memoirs to appear and that will take many, many years. Um, but with that caveat, let me describe what I think is the most uh, plausible explanation. Uh, and, and I think it fits well with what Dr. Zaloznaya has, has just explained. Putin believes that the United States and its allies are disrespecting Russia, and by extension Putin himself, because they don't acknowledge what is due to Russia, which is recognition as a great power, which is entitled to a sphere of influence. And Ukraine, of course, is the most important element in that sphere of influence. Putin is now older than we may think of him. He will turn 70 this year, and he's concerned about his legacy. He sees his historical mission as being to ensure Ukraine's loyalty to Russia and separation from the West. In addition, Putin's circle of advisors has become much narrower in recent years, especially with the onset of the pandemic. I'm sure everyone has seen the pictures of how far Putin separates himself from his advisors at these really long tables and uh, all the memes that have uh, been generated uh, by those pictures. And one element of that is theatrics. Uh, but even beyond the theatrics, it's been clear for some time that Putin is meeting with fewer people and allowing fewer members of Russia's elite to have input into his planning. And those few close advisors that he does rely on hold particularly hawkish and anti-Western views. Putin calculated that Russia was strong enough to make a bold move to rearrange the global balance of power. He saw Russia's military as significantly stronger than before due to large scale investments in new equipment and better training over the last decade. He saw the economy as able to withstand new sanctions uh, because of its very low debt and large cash reserves. His regime had put an end to all political opposition and made it too dangerous for citizens to join into protests, or so he thought. And prior to the invasion, the view of most experts was that Russia was indeed much stronger than it had been since Putin took office. As soon as Putin began the invasion, however, events cast doubt on Russia's actual strength, 
while its standing in world affairs plummeted. Russia is now isolated with very few international supporters. And also it's worth noting that a sizable portion of Russia's military equipment and manpower, perhaps one fifth, is being thrown into this invasion. US intelligence estimates that close to all of the forces that were gathered around Ukraine's borders in previous months have now entered Ukrainian territory. But Ukraine's army is having success in destroying Russian equipment and capturing its soldiers. So this war may in fact have a, a demonstrable impact on the strength of Russia's military. And as well, the damage to Russia's economy from the sanctions is already starting to emerge. Public protests are much more robust than anyone expected, given the high levels of repression that have been used over the past several years and that were reinforced recently. So prior to the invasion, Putin saw the US and the West more generally as weak and divided as has-beens in global power terms. He looked at the extent of political polarization in Western countries, at the damage the former president did to US relations with its allies, at last year's hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan. And he figured that A, the response to his invasion would be similar to when he invaded Georgia in 2008 or Ukraine in 2014, that is manageable. And B, that this might weaken or even fracture Western institutions. So clearly he's gotta be really shocked that the actual results include overwhelming global public opinion against Russia and in support of Ukraine, swift and coordinated multilateral sanctions well beyond any used previously against Russia, the voluntary withdrawal from Russia's economy of a whole range of major international corporations, the reversal of 50 years of German foreign policy away from cooperation with Russia and toward a stronger military investment, public support for NATO membership that's rising in Finland and Sweden, uh, and the list goes on. So although it is really still uh, quite early days, both militarily and diplomatically, and in terms of uh, public, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, PR effort, uh, still I have to conclude that Putin's cost benefit calculus was, was off by an incredible amount. Putin had already earned a place in Russian history as the man who returned Russia to stability and a measure of prosperity after the suffering they experienced in the 1990s. But with his decision to invade Ukraine, he has undone most or all of that progress, evidently in search of an even grander legacy. So that's the best I can do to explain the background to this, uh, to this decision that has plunged uh, Ukraine into war. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. We'll now go to uh, Professor Farrell for an international law perspective. So Professor Farrell, international law has been invoked by both parties and the international community. What laws apply? How will countries and international institutions seek to apply and enforce these laws? Thanks, Dean Wing. Uh, I'll briefly describe three relevant bodies of international law, and then I'll discuss how they've been used in this conflict. The first is the law on the use of force by states, which is primarily governed by the Charter of the United Nations adopted in 1945. Article two of the UN Charter prohibits the use of force by one state against another. Uh, the Charter recognizes only two uh, exceptions to that rule authorization by the UN Security Council and self-defense. The second body of law is international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict. These rules govern how armed conflict is conducted. Separately from the question of whether a war is legal, this set of rules attempts to make warfare more humane and minimize suffering. These are laws set out in the Geneva Conventions, other treaties, and international customary law. They prohibit the use of certain weapons. Uh, they require that attacks be proportionate and against military targets. They set rules for treatment of the wounded and prisoners of war, govern occupation of territory and things like this. The third body of law is human rights law. Uh, these are obligations of states toward all people regardless of the existence of an armed conflict. These include things like the right to life, freedom of conscience, 
personal liberty, the prohibition against torture, and rights of refugees. These rights are set out in instruments such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the European Convention on Human Rights. These rights are always applicable, although some can be validly suspended during emergencies, and during armed conflict, this body of law is co-applicable with the laws of armed conflict. So, for example, the general human right to life will be read differently during a conflict, and a combatant who is legally killed pursuant to the laws of war might not be a violation of the human right to life. So how have these laws been used by the states in the conflict? Uh, first of all, and this was referred to already, Russia attempted to justify its invasion as a legitimate use of force against Ukraine, uh, citing, among other things, the notion of humanitarian intervention to prevent genocide. Uh, in addition to being factually suspect, uh, this type of intervention is only legal with Security Council authorization, which did not occur here. They've also raised self-defense in a variety of ways. Self-defense of Russia, uh, collective self-defense of Donbass and Luhansk, whose independence it recognized shortly before invading, and even self-defense of the Ukrainian people, arguing that the Kiev government has been illegitimate since 2014. And this is where these concepts and these arguments of denazification have come in. These self-defense arguments have been resoundingly rejected as pretexts lacking any factual basis, and they also stretch the notion of self-defense uh, beyond even the controversial Gulf War notion of preemptive self-defense to something that sounds more like preventative self-defense. The body, uh, the international body, the primary responsibility for maintenance of international peace and security, which would usually address acts of aggression, is the United Nations Security Council. It has not taken action, of course, because Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council, and it vetoed the resolution condemning its invasion of Ukraine. In a somewhat rare move, the Security Council referred the matter to the UN General Assembly. While it doesn't have the same binding authority as the Security Council, the General Assembly did adopt a resolution condemning the invasion by a vote of 141 to 5, with 35 states abstaining. Uh, now, this is not legally binding action, but it's strong, what we would call soft law, uh, condemning the invasion and showing international uh, rejection of these notions. Ukraine has also submitted a case to the International Court of Justice, which resolves disputes between countries under the Genocide Convention. And essentially, it seems to be asking the court to adjudicate that the genocide that Russia has cited as a pretext for invasion was not, in fact, happening, uh, again, showing that the invasion was illegal on that uh, pretext. Ukraine has also turned to the International Criminal Court, which holds individuals accountable for certain serious crimes similar to what the Nuremberg trials did after the Second World War. While neither Russia nor Ukraine is a party to the International Criminal Court, Ukraine has issued a declaration giving that court jurisdiction over events in Ukraine, and 34 other countries uh, subsequently asked the International Criminal Court prosecutor to launch an investigation. Now, while the ICC statute does include the crime of aggression as an individual charge, that won't be pursued here because for that particular crime, a state has to consent to jurisdiction over its nationals. And of course, Russia won't do so. The other option to get uh, jurisdiction over the crime of aggression is for the Security Council to refer it. And again, that won't happen. But the International Criminal Court prosecutor has already initiated an investigation that will cover other crimes under the court's jurisdiction, such as war crimes or crimes against humanity, if they take place on the territory of Ukraine, because for those crimes, uh, Ukraine has given consent and territorial jurisdiction uh, will exist. Now, I think we need to be realistic about the prospects for indictments. Uh, legally, crimes against humanity, for example, have to be widespread, systematic, and pursuant to a policy, right? So there's a high level uh, of proof that's required. And practically, you have to have secure, or you have to be able to secure custody over an individual who ordered them. Uh, nonetheless, I think this is a significant move and may show the importance of international criminal law in a way that we've not seen recently. Finally, the prospect, prospect for enforcement of human rights violations is greater here than it has been in many situations because Russia and Ukraine are both parties to the European Convention on Human Rights and are both subject to the compulsory jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. 
Shortly after the invasion, Ukraine sought provisional measures from the court, uh, and they've already been granted by the court. And the European court has a history of asserting strong human rights protection, even during situations of armed conflict. So the European court will add another layer of accountability in terms of state responsibility for attacks on civilians or institutions such as hospitals, schools, and public works facilities. And I look forward to discussing further during our question and answer. Thank you very much, Professor Farrell. We will now go to our last panelist, last but certainly not least, Ambassador McMullen. You spent a career in the Foreign Service. You've been an ambassador to a number of countries. Can you tell us what efforts at diplomacy have been tried here or are being tried or likely to be tried? And what prospects are there for success with any of these diplomatic efforts? Thank you, Adrian. I'd like to start off by saying that uh, Colin Powell uh, described diplomacy as persuasion in the shadow of power. Without power, it's just naked pleading. So what our um, government officials, our diplomats are trying to do is to persuade others to do what we want them to do with the might of the United States and its allies uh, behind it. Uh, so what I'd like to, and so most of the time it's seeking to persuade. Sometimes it's just symbolic. Uh, last, and so an effort at uh, symbolic diplomacy happened last week when uh, Russia and Ukraine were supposed to meet um, kind of on the borders between Belarus and Ukraine to talk about a ceasefire. It was, it was a failure. Russian media reported that the uh, negotiations would happen in a forest dacha, Viskuli dacha, that had symbolic importance for President Putin because it was at that forest dacha, this little cabin in the, actually quite a, a nice mansion in the woods, uh, where in December of 1991, the leaders of Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine got together and the Slavic presidents of the USSR uh, decided that it was time to end the USSR. Um, and President Gorbachev then on Christmas day of 91 made it official. So this dacha, I actually don't know if the negotiations happened there, but the Russia media said that's where the negotiations were going to happen. So that was very symbolic for President Putin because it was the place where the Soviet Union was really undone. It was kind of like Hitler making France surrender in 1940 in the same rail car where Germany had to sign the armistice in 1918. So uh, sometimes it can be symbolic. Usually it's to persuade. So I'd like to talk a little bit. Uh, Brian raised the um, UN General Assembly resolution uh, in this special emergency session. And if we can maybe get Erica to share uh, the screen here, this was the outcome of this uh, General Assembly resolution uh, and the sort of the active language there was to um, deplore Russian aggression in Ukraine and demand that Russian military forces withdraw from the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine. So this is a pretty, in, in my view, in, in terms of history, about as clear cut as we're gonna get in terms of aggression and breaking the UN charter. And we can see by the map here that the yellow countries voted in favor of this. And as Brian correctly pointed out, there were. 141 countries uh, out of the 193 members of the UN that voted in favor of this re resolution deploring Russia's aggression against Ukraine. There are quite a lot of blue countries, and these are the countries that uh, the light blue is abstained, and there were 35 of those. The dark blue was absent, didn't vote, and there were 12 of those. So altogether, those that voted against the resolution, there were five, Altogether, there were 52 countries in the world that did not support this resolution, uh, deploring one of the most blatant acts of aggression um, I've ever seen. Um, so I think uh, it's kind of interesting to look why did some of the countries fail to support this resolution? And first we'll notice that China uh, abstained and much of Central Asia was either, uh, uh, they abstained or were absent from the vote. But surprisingly, there are quite a few countries in Africa that also abstain. Um, and I'd like to offer just a, a, a comment here. Just before the pandemic, 
President Putin had an Africa-Russia summit in Sochi, and 43 heads of government from Africa were flown to Sochi, probably consumed a lot of vodka and caviar and uh, exchange uh, platitudes on friendship and cooperation. There is another one planned in September. And so there was probably a lot of goodwill generated at that. Uh, also, many of the countries that abstained in Africa had support during their uh, liberation from colonial rule from the Soviet Union. Some of it was political, some of it was diplomatic, some of it was military. And so that legacy of Soviet and Russian support during their liberation, I think also weighs um, on their statecraft. Remember that when the Doughboys landed in France in 1917, one of their cries was Lafayette, we are here. And so as the French had helped us in our uh, liberation struggle against uh, England. So that probably played some impact, had some impact. Lastly, I think are the, the visuals of Africans trying to leave Ukraine on the border with Poland and elsewhere, being ill-treated by Ukrainian border guards. And I think that really hit home in a number of African countries. Uh, besides those three, uh, sort of the support for liberation, the, the, the gathering at Sochi in 2019, and, um, and sort of the ill will generated by the, some of the border scenes with Africans being ill-treated there, there are some specific country reasons as well. So if you look at Central African Republic and Mali, for example, they both abstained. Both of those uh, juntas in Central African Republic and Mali are being supported in part by Wagner mercenaries. There are about 600 in Bangui and now about 1,000 in Mali that have replaced French and other European troops there to support those nearly failed governments. And so those governments are very indebted to the Wagner group, which is very close to President Putin. Uh, we also see that India abstained, which was kind of a shocker. India has uh, just concluded a $5 billion weapons deal with Russia. About two thirds of India's uh, modern military weapons um, come from Russia. And they're about to deploy the um, S-400 anti-aircraft missile system, one of the best in the world. If they deploy it, it will maybe invoke US sanctions on India. So India is very dependent uh, or uh, very close to Russia because of its military uh, procurement. Uh, we also see kind of in South Asia region near India, two surprising votes in favor of the resolution, Afghanistan um, and Burma. Um, and those are the results of credentials fights in New York where the civilian elected governments of Ghani before the Taliban uh, stormed into Kabul in August and the, um, the democratically uh, elected government in Burma headed by Aung San Suu Kyi, those uh, diplomats from the Ghani administration and the civilian administration in Burma still control the vote for their countries in the General Assembly. So surprisingly, we see Afghanistan and Burma vote to deplore Russian aggression in, in, uh, um, in Ukraine. And another really, so there are a lot of, peculiar reasons for voting. If you look in Central America, you can see the blue, big blue spot there is um, Nicaragua, which has a Marxist uh, very uh, government, very friendly with Russia. But right next to it, you can almost see um, El Salvador, which has been an ally of the US. El Salvador abstained. And their new young president, uh, Nayib Bukele, is a big fan of Bitcoin and thought that uh, being uh, using Bitcoin as an official currency would help his country uh, be on the cutting edge of financial and, and service um, industries. Um, but he is very upset with the uh, US government for uh, uh, cautioning and launching studies into the use of Bitcoin for money laundering. And that has really dampened the takeoff of Bitcoin as the uh, economic jet for El Salvador. So I think uh, people in Beijing can look at this map and say, huh, 52 countries didn't support this most blatant, egregious uh, attack of Russia on, uh, on Ukraine, and a lot more countries owe us a lot more than they owe Russia. So I think if this were to be replicated in the immediate aftermath of a Chinese invasion of uh, Taiwan, that the, there'd be a lot more blue 
um, on the on the map than there is currently. Um, so we can leave the map up, or uh, Erica, if you'd like to take it down. I'd like to talk a little bit about oil. Oil is another uh, field of diplomacy right now. We have banned imports of Russian oil. Um, that doesn't mean that the amount of oil produced changes. So there'll be short-term disruptions as we buy more oil from Kuwait and Russia sells more oil to China. But the United States has been involved in trying to get some swing producers to increase the production of oil because the price of oil has gone up remarkably quickly in the last week because of uncertainty and volatility in futures markets in oil. And so uh, last week, the US sent a delegation to Venezuela, a potentially large oil producer currently sanctioned by the US for human rights and other abuses. Uh, no, no progress on oil, but at least two Americans who were unjustly imprisoned there were released. Um, we've tried to get Saudi Arabia, Arabia to up their production. Uh, they're the biggest, most immediate potential swing producer. Uh, but President Biden has been unable to get the crown prince of Saudi Arabia to even receive a call, to accept a phone call from the White House. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman is very upset with the United States uh, for coming to the very uh, edge of, of returning to the Iran nuclear deal, which Saudi Arabia uh, greatly opposes. And Saudi Arabia is also really mad uh, with the Biden administration for its lack of support in the face of repeated attacks on Saudi Arabia by the Houthis, rebels in, um, in Yemen. And, and the Crown Prince is personally um, upset with the president because of the uncertainties about the, some lawsuits brought in the US uh, by uh, supporters of the, the murdered journalist, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, um, and the CIA and others have said that the um, crown prince had a, a direct hand in authorizing that. So um, President Biden can't even get the crown prince of Saudi Arabia to pick up the phone to talk about uh, increasing oil production. The other swing producer that could very quickly add lots of oil to the international market and drive down prices is Iran. Last week, we were on sort of half a foot away from uh, re-establishing the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, over the weekend, Russia imposed a, a condition. They wanted written, uh, written assurance from the United States that Russia would be able to unimpededly trade and invest with Iran, uh, regardless of any Western sanctions on Russia. And so, of course, this would be a huge loophole in all of the West uh, sanctions against Russia, that Russia could drive a semi truck through with no problem. And so we thought we were going to be right, uh, maybe today or maybe on Friday, uh, uh, have announcing a new uh, a return to the Iran nuclear deal and the US lifting sanctions on Iran that would allow them immediately. They've got hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil uh, being stored on, on ships in the Persian Gulf, which could immediately be released and drive down the oil price. But Russia blocked that um, effectively, I think, uh, in the negotiation. Um, and so in terms of oil and the United, the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, this very interesting and unusual case of the Polish MiG-29s, which has uh, arrived uh, on the international scene in the last few days. Um, Poland has 28 MiG-29s, a 40-year-old uh, Soviet-made fighter jet that Poland said we could give to, that Poland said they would be interested in donating to Ukraine if the United States could backfill with F-15s. F-15s, um, the production of them is limited and those that are being produced now have been promised to Taiwan, which needs them desperately. So that's an interesting added complication. And just uh, the other day, Poland publicly announced that uh, they wouldn't allow the transfer directly from Poland to Ukraine have to go to a U.S. Air Force base in Ramstein, Germany, and then could be transferred to Ukraine. But Putin says that this would be a, an act of war. And so the, these old 40-year-old, uh, uh, well, I don't know if they're all 40-year-old, but the, these older sort of second-tier uh, Polish jets could be donated to Ukraine, but probably not from a NATO or even an EU country. And I understand there's been some talk about uh, discussions with Kosovo 
as a transit point from either Poland or Ramstein to Ukraine. Poland is neither, excuse me, uh, Kosovo, uh, Iowa is, is Kosovo's sister state, as you know well, Adrian. Um, so there's some discussion, I think, right now ongoing in Pristina about potentially using Kosovo as a transit point for these Polish aircraft. Poland is in kind of a, a, a key geographical situation. It's the only country in the world that borders both Russia and Belarus and Ukraine. And so it, uh, it is a key player here, but it, it's public pronouncement that it needed to transfer these to the US first. It's like proposing on the jumbo board at Kinnick. It's not really done, it's, you know, Mary Lou, will you marry me? That really puts pressure on Mary Lou to, uh, to accept. And I think that's what the polls meant. That's really not done. That's not standard diplomacy. So I think they were seeking to relieve some of the potential threat against themselves and up the pressure on the US. So there are lots of moving parts right now around the world. Most wars end on a negotiated uh, conclusion. Um, and this one will as well, whether it's you know this month or uh, later, later in the spring, no one knows. Russia has committed 200,000 troops to the fight. It has uh, maybe 700,000 it hasn't committed and 2 million reservists it hasn't drawn up. So while we see, we're seeing Russia stalled right now, um, how much pain is, is uh, the Russian military and the Russian government willing to take before they get to serious negotiations looking to be for an off-ramp um, that we can persuade them to stop their attacks and withdraw. So uh, diplomacy is at work and will be involved to the end, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, now, if all of our panelists uh, could uh, come, come on, uh, we have um, about seven minutes <laughs> to have questions and we have uh, many questions. So I'm going to uh pick among the questions and and ask for one person uh to answer a question and to make your answers extremely succinct uh there's a question what would you like to see in terms of action from congress or the federal government in addition to aid who would like to spend 30 seconds <laughs> giving any any answer to that anybody want to uh step in at all well well maybe i can just say uh there are bills moving through congress uh now for both uh military and humanitarian aid um and i think um we need these things to happen more quickly than Congress usually does things. So uh, that's probably the only thing. I, the, the bills seem to be sizable and uh, they, they're aimed at the right kind of things, but uh, they need to get to Ukraine quickly. Thank you. China is in a position to exert enormous leverage over Russia. Do you think they're likely to do anything before it's too late? Anybody want to take 30 seconds for that? <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, Ron. Yes. I'm yeah, ready. I think uh, China will probably uh, be able to buy a lot of uh, Russian commodities. Russia is the uh, largest exporter of natural gas, the second largest exporter of crude oil, and the largest exporter of wheat. So if other countries block Russian exports or don't do business with them for financial concerns, uh, China is likely to be able to be the, the market of last resort for Russian commodities and probably at a sizable discount. So it might be a lifeline to Russia and uh, economic boon for China. Thank you. How does NATO play into all of this? Would Ukraine joining NATO actually be a threat to Russia? Anybody? Uh, no, nobody wants to touch this. Uh. Well, I, I will say I, I think uh, we can't answer that because uh, Ukraine can't go into NATO for 
decades. Uh, and uh, certainly now after the war, its prospects for joining NATO uh, are even worse. So who knows uh, you know, what Russia's level of strength will be at that time, what international relations will look like. Uh, I think all along the claim that Ukraine was about to join NATO has been a red herring and not really one of the drivers behind this. Thank you. I've researched the population pyramids of Ukraine and other countries involved. What roles might population dynamics play? I can take that. Uh, to my belief, I think that the, the population pyramids in Ukraine and Russia are pretty much alike. Uh, we see the population aging, uh, especially there's more women than men. Than men which is pretty common, especially at the older age, as we reach like 25 to 60 um, cohort and uh, older in years. So I'm not sure that the differences in the population and the size of cohorts within the population in Ukraine and Russia, I don't think that there are big differences and I'm not sure if there's any reason to believe that the population dynamics would um, play a big role in the current war. Thank you. Given that Putin's first goal to use full force to take over all of Ukraine has failed, could his new goal be to take part of Ukraine, especially the quarter around the Black Sea? Would the world tolerate such an outcome? I can address the first part of this question. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we, we're quite able to say at this point in time that the goal of fully taking over Ukraine has failed. Um, I think it has failed in a way that Putin wanted it originally uh, in a shock and awe type of campaign, right? This is likely to be prolonged and very costly uh, endeavor for the Russian military. Uh, however, I think at this point in time, we cannot predict what the end of the uh, conflict is going to look like. However, um, I have heard the reports that the the strategy may have shifted um, to, um, you know, the, the, the overtaking of or the surrounding of Kiev so that the Kiev would surrender, right? Uh, but I think Alison in asking this question is correct by pointing out that uh, a lot of the uh, immediate military activity was concentrated in, in the south of the country, specifically trying to block Ukraine's access to this Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, right? Where, where the, uh, the country's access to, 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 to seaport uh, is. And again, I think that all of this is very much um, an indication of a shifting strategy from uh, President Putin, right? Uh, to rapidly uh, uh, sort of changing situation on the ground and also an unexpected resistance from Ukrainians and the international community. Thank you. There's many more questions and, and we've, we've run out of time. Uh, and this is fascinating. Uh, we'll let everybody know that, uh, you know, as events develop in Ukraine, we may hold another webinar. Uh, but at this point, uh, I have to uh, close today's events. It's, it's been a fascinating discussion. I've learned quite a bit. Please let's thank our panelists and our sponsors once again. I would also like to thank UICHR's tech guru, Erica Christensen, for all of her efforts. This event has been taped and will be on our website in the next couple of days. Our website is uichr.uiowa.edu. You will find our entire webinar collection at that uh, address. We have more great programming coming up soon. Next week is uh, spring break uh, for the university, so uh, we don't have any programming. But on March 30th, we will be delighted to uh, do our second episode in our climate change and human rights series. The topic on March 30th will be human rights and climate change, intergenerational rights and duties. Finally, please consider a tax deductible donation to UICHR on our website. 
Our program is made possible in large part due to the generosity of many of our viewers. So thank you everyone and please have a wonderful afternoon and let's continue to um, pray uh, for the people of Ukraine uh, and all of their relatives and neighbors and supporters around the world. Bye.